Welcome to episode number 81 of the Roundtable. I'm Grant Brisby here with Danny McCauley and Mark Craig. Mark, how are you doing today? I'm great. I'm great. I'm, I'm glad to be here, Grant. That's fantastic. That's yeah. fantastic. Isn't I, it? I, I can feel the good vibes already. Andy, how are you doing? <laughs> I'm great. I'm great. I'm glad to be here, Grant. Are you rested? No. No. I took a I, I took a 19 hour flight from uh, from Singapore. I got off the there? plane at like six in the morning, and <laughs> you know I'm here, man. I'm fired up and ready to go. This is Loopy Andy, like Loopy McCullough is the best McCullough. You get yeah. you get you can get bitter McCullough. You can get McCullough <laughs> with the ass that you can see from space, but Loopy McCullough. There's just something about that. Uh, I got I got good vibes from this one. Yeah. Um, all right, so let's see. Baseball, it's uh Oh, okay. You guys don't want to ask about my trip? That's fine. Yeah, no. Great well, to I didn't see know you. how much you wanted to share. No, that's yeah. fine. Did you have yeah, some no. pho? I had some pho. Yeah, yeah. What was my your favorite I... pho? Uh There uh there was a a, a pho ga in uh, Hanoi that was really good. Um and there was a a, a pho thai in uh in saigon that was also really great uh my wife and i went on our honeymoon in vietnam for the listeners um but yeah no one cares no fine let's talk about pakoda i care well, that's more important than my I life care. you know what i've always wanted to do Grant? on a baseball podcast yeah yeah it like, kind of is but yeah go, go ahead podcast Mark. Yeah. barely acknowledges baseball baseball <laughs> is like the art form that we use to you know sort of get get metaphysical like then here, right. I'll, I'll bring some baseball to this. As someone who's been to twenty nine of thirty current major league parks, I'll tell you what is an underrepresented food group in the concessions. Mm. It's Vietnamese. Vietnamese yeah. food is wonderful. And I've always wanted to like start like a concession stand, and I would call it Ball Pho. Oh, that's pretty good. That's pretty good. I like it. I like it. Ball Pho. You're in, right? You're in. Yeah. yeah. I'm in. I'm in for twenty five percent. Oh well, yeah. All right, we'll get the paperwork done after this. Let's hurry through it. At least we have a plan if journalism doesn't work out. <laughs> Man, our boy's back. Mm. He's back. Boy, oh boy. Well, uh, just because I can't get this out of my head, so I have to right now. Danny Graves. Okay, let's now move on to baseball tie. It just he, the player born in Vietnam. Like I have to like it's rattling oh. around in my head. Danny so, Graves is born in Vietnam. Yes, sir. How about that? Yeah, so I had, it was just bouncing around in my head, so I had to get that out. Um, baseball stuff, eh, yeah, I mean, great, your trip. Uh, we, you know, I haven't left the country in like 25 years, but, you know, whatever. Good for you. Good for you. Um, <laughs> Grant, you need to chill, man. Uh, it's, not, it's not my fault your team hasn't spent any money. Uh, man, no, they're waiting for the 60 day IL to open up. That's, that's my, that's my new working theory. Uh, um, yeah. yeah. Welcome <laughs> to the 49ers say- roundtable. Uh, episode 81 famously, uh, that's Terrell owns his number, uh, for both the Eagles and the 49ers. One of uh, those teams is playing in the Super Bowl. Oh, boy, it's not the I Eagles. was on a plane. I was on a plane, uh, in Vietnam and, uh, and, when I had reception, it was like, wow, the Niners are getting their asses kicked by the Lions. Yeah. And then we landed. I was just like thinking up all these jokes I was going to have. You know, I was just going to torch Grant. And then we landed and I checked the score and I was like, well, what the heck happened? Yeah, it was. So uh, I watched the Packers uh, Niners game uh, here mm-hmm. with my family around me. And for the Lions Niners game, they they left on purpose. Um, hmm. because of how I acted during the night. So like they have not had a clean run to the Super Bowl and uh, I'm confined to the room now for the Super Bowl. I can't even watch it with my family. Yeah. Um, so, but that, that's where we're at right now. Because you're going to have so many takes about Taylor Swift. <laughs> because I, like I, I regress. Yeah. Right. I regress and I become one of those guys like, let's go. Oh, <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh, come on. Hit that scene. Hurr! You know, yeah. like it drives my wife nuts because she, you know, explicitly set out to not marry that guy. And she <laughs> did for the most part. Um, yeah. But, you know, I get like that with football. I have uh, I, I, I still like when I see the a fumble, I just immediately go ball. <laughs> <laughs> that's you know, the old lineman. Yeah, that's just, you know, like a, a childhood and, you know, adolescence spent playing football. When you see the when you see the ball, you just ball. You know, you know uh, I saw your, your Philly accent comes roaring back when you talk about football. Yeah, like you just did it. Like well, it, it's, it's the, like listening yeah. to like you know Kylie Kelsey. Like yeah, it, it, like it's the same. Like whoa. Well, the, the thing is, from? is like playing football was like the 
was like my personality basically until I stopped playing football, you know, after my, my high school career, you know, after my senior year, like that's that your, your personality is just like, I play on the football team. And that's, that's basically all that, you know, and now your personality is uh, I've had several concussions. So it, like, <laughs> leading into the present. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Now, now my personality is uh, I covered the Kansas city Royals. <laughs> Son of a. There it, there, is. It is. there it is. Hey, uh, there was a trade. Uh, Corbin Burns got traded. Yes, sir. sir. That was and interesting. I, was the last podcast that we had where we semi excoriated the Orioles for not doing I that? defended the Orioles. Okay. I defended the Orioles because what my argument was, and I love pointing out when I'm right because it happens so often. So I like pointing this out uh, is that, you know, there was no, there's no clock, right? No clock. You there's make no that clock move in, in December. You make that move in February, you get the player. And, um, you know, apparently the two teams have been working on it for quite some time. They finally got over the finish line. I like the trade for both teams. I, I yeah. like, I get it. Like, if you're a Brewers fan, it just sucks. Like, it sucks. There's no way if you're a Brewers fan to, like, feel great about it. But I think in terms for one year, even of an uh, elite type player, um, they got two pretty legit prospects plus a fairly high draft pick. Um, I That feels like a pretty good return. Um, you know, I, and I, how can you dislike this deal for the Orioles? Right. right? Like you, they got Corbin Burns. That's awesome. Like good for them. I, you they know, got prospect. when you have prospects coming out yeah. of your ears, you make a trade like this. Yeah. The, you know, Ortiz is a guy who like, I frankly did not know a ton about and kind of, you know, talked to a couple folks and like looked into his numbers. I'm like, Oh, this guy's great. Like he could play, uh, uh, nowhere for the Orioles, <laughs> uh, you know, like he's, he's completely blocked at all three, you know, infield positions. Uh, Keith Law so, had him really high on his top 100 list, like top 50. I want to say yeah. above Marco Luciano, like he was, he was up there, even though he's 25, but you can't hold that against him because the Orioles didn't really have a place for him. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you know, the Brewers people seem to, to like DL hall and they think that he can be a starter. And, you know, so if you're telling, you know, you're getting, theoretically six years of DL Hall and, you know, six years of Joey Ortiz and, you know, for one year Burns, it just, but it just, it sucks uh, if you're the Brewers uh, to have to make these sorts of trades, but Hey, they've been doing it for, you know, quite some time and being okay with it. DL yeah. Hall sounds like a, a defensive back name. Like he's a speedy he corner, third round corner. <laughs> yes. Hofstra. Yes. Um, but also he's glad that they changed the deal to the IL because those, like if he can't, you know, if he's got a career that where it's a lot of injuries, that would, that would suck. Well, he has dealt with them in his career. And so, um, you know, maybe now they've changed it to the IL. It's time for DL yeah, to step up, hit the ASG. <laughs> I don't know. Man. I'm sorry. I, I was on a 19 hour flight. You ever take a 19 hour flight? It's long. I, I, uh, I took a, a 19 hour flight to Moscow um, once. Um, back when I was in high school and it's still the USSR. But that's yeah. a story for another time. Mark, I cut you off. What, what were you going to say? No, I just listened to you guys' world travels. Like, it's a nice view from the, you know, first world. Um, so, like, you know, 19-hour flights to Moscow and Vietnam, that's great. Um, yeah. <laughs> it's wonderful. I can tell you about the time I went to Tijuana. Anyone want to hear that? No? Okay. I don't think – well, I think there's a lot of problems with that. You, that live in a, that. you live in a New Jersey mansion. What are you talking that about? That is not a mansion. I live in a one-bedroom. <laughs> <laughs> and the cat takes the bed. He yeah. sleeps on the couch. <laughs> I live in a one-bedroom. I can't put my cat anywhere so that I can sleep through the night. That was honestly, my cat had meowing problems in the middle of the night when I moved uh, to, from an apartment to this house. And the first night he meowed and I was like, oh, check this out, a garage. <laughs> and he never meowed again. It was like, yeah. it was amazing. He's like, oh, crap. They got plans now. So yeah, <laughs> yeah. Just buy a house. Bootstraps. Yeah, just right, right. Make yourself indispensable. Uh, let's go. Oh, let's go. Keep going. Just keep going. Keep going. All right. We're, we're having fun here. On <laughs> Corbin Burns. I like it for the Orioles. I, I don't know. It, it seems like it was the only possible move for them in a way, but I keep going back to, yes, they've got prospects bleeding out of their ears. They've got all these young players. I think they can afford, like, again, this is me talking, and I'm not exactly of the Angelos family. Uh, or the, the new owners uh, coming in, but it feels like they can afford a bad contract for the next few years because they're going to have all these underpaid guys subsidizing that. Yeah, um, it totally could afford it. 
there's very little in their mo that suggests that they're going to want to do that well yeah um you know and 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 maybe the new uh maybe the new ownership group you know is um is more cohenish yeah i mean maybe you know they come from that sort of world um you know it's uh I, i i just don't know like yeah i guess you could do a bad deal but like i don't know i i I mean, like, I like their strategy if you're going to be aggressive in situations like this. I I like, you know, holstering the prospects and and going after Corbin Burns rather than, you know, uh, and, and in the other times, you know, picking up number fours and number fives and ballast and, you know, not, you know, giving $100 million to a number three starter. Mm. Or number four, you know what I mean? I don't know. Yeah, I, I get you. You can I do it both you. ways. I, I, you can do it both ways. Yeah, I get you. I, I mean, this kind of dovetails into what we were going to talk about. We're a baseball prospectus. They released released their Pakota projections, uh, their Pakota standings, projected standings. And first off, people get so mad about projections and projected standings. And it's like they're if you look at them the right way, they're just fun. They're just taking the players on the team. Here's what they did in the past, spitting out the numbers, and it's just it's it's uh, it's a fun exercise. It's not. A prediction it's not a crystal ball um so take it for what it is and i just think it's fascinating that the uh, orioles are kind of in the middle of the pack what, yeah. what were they 80 87 80, 86 yeah 86. 86 6, wins. Yeah. yeah so i mean it's um which is i would think it has a lot to do with regressing to the mean sort of like after that big Bullpen. bump up to 100 yeah it's stuff like that <laughs> um but it's just it's interesting to see of the teams that could use like one more Blake Snell or one Cody Bellinger, like where does that move the needle? Um, there's a lot of teams in baseball where they can use uh, that one weird free agent trick to get a, a little bit better and separate themselves. So I think the one thing that we should look at with the Orioles right now is when have you known people to make a big splash, buy into a baseball team, have a controlling interest and not want to flex a little bit right afterward? Mm. Okay. And so it doesn't necessarily mean that like you're throwing money, like, you know, money at people that, you know, making intentionally bad decisions. But I think there's a human part of this. Like you've just bought the club. Like who does that to then just sit there and not spend money on it? New sheriff in town. You know, like, yeah, there's, and like, you know, you can sit there and laugh about it, whether it's good or bad and do the analysis or whatever. But sometimes human nature wins out. And when you look at this sport, by the way, there's plenty of examples of this particular thing happening. All right. That like a lot of times you will see people, you know, get really excited and just sort of go go at it. And like Steve Cohen is sort of the ex- extreme example of this. But I think we've seen this phenomenon take place more than once. Right. So am I saying that's going to automatically happen here with the Baltimore Orioles? No. Um, but am I saying that historically when, when you know, well-heeled owners buy in, like is there such a phenomenon as sort of riding that wave and getting excited and sort of, you know, I guess there's a political aspect of this too. You want to show your fan base that, you know, build some goodwill and, and all that. Um, it wouldn't be shocking if they went and did something like that. I mean, to me, I, I don't know. Like it just seems like, <clears throat> again, the human nature of it, timing, wanting to get the goodwill from like a new fan base um seems to line up for hey i wouldn't rule that out so can i tell you what kind of owner i would be i would wear i would dress like roger stone you know what i mean like i would i'd like the riddler like i'd have uh, maybe a cane with like a crystal on top and i would be very present in all the games and i would just spend uh, all of my fortune like literally just spend all of it so if anyone wants to back me in that endeavor um, I would be your guy. I, if that sounds like fun to you, like Kickstarter, Patreon, stuff like that. All right, sorry. <laughs> but I but honestly, I agree that now's the time if the Orioles are getting, I, I don't know when the deal actually goes through. I'm not as Wolver, you know, I'm not a uh, draw uh, I don't know what, when it's going through, when the papers are going to be signed and all that stuff. Um, but yeah, it, if they were to do it in before the off season ends, uh, this would be, uh, uh, this would be, like the the way to do it just come on in i don't know where exactly the orioles 
would spend though, because they've already got now Corbin Burns, their rotation's pretty filled out. Um, if they wanted to build a Super Bowl pen, well, Josh Hader's gone. I mean, I don't think you can do much about it now. Um, I don't see someone like uh, uh, someone like uh, Cody Bellinger uh, making you know moving the needle. They have no need for someone like Matt Chapman. Uh, so maybe I'm just talking out of the side of my mouth in that it's Corbin Burns was the play. They did it. They're great. Hooray world. Well, like I mean, here here's the other part of that, Grant. Like I mean, when we're talking about making a splash. And like I know you're talking particularly about before the offseason ends, mm -hmm. but like I think we should extend that out too. Don't you think they're in position to take on money and trades mm -hmm. right now? Right? That's like that's point. another way to kind of leverage your financial might. Is is and then by the way, that's a way to also mitigate whatever prospect capital you would have to burn in right. a trade like that. Is that you just you know take on the freight? And and so I think that is something that you know, off my earlier point, like if you see them get aggressive in that part of the market where, okay, here's a good player, there's a lot of contract here to eat um, or, or take on, you would think they'd be in the front of the line for mm -hmm. that because it, it sort of serves dual purposes, right? Like you're, you know, you have the money, you can spend that, but, you know, the more likely you are to, or more willing you are to spend actual dollars and cents, the less, you know, uh, compelled you are to have to like expend prospect capital so it just seems like that's a a natural fit especially given the timing of them you know again changing ownership and like what we talked about the momentum of wanting to um you know establish right away that you're serious players about getting winner on the field yeah that all tracks that all tracks it'll be an interesting deadline for the orioles do you have the picota uh spreadsheet open or spreadsheet the page the web page open so we, if i like jump to a, a, a couple teams like you're not like what the hell are you talking about what i'm focused on a lot is in the national league you've got the dodgers projected to win 101 the braves 101.7 so essentially 101 uh that's pretty impressive because projection systems they're usually i mean they're very uh um conservative in a lot of these projections win projections just by definition you know they're not projecting a ton of outliers so to have a system projecting 200 win teams is actually rare and it speaks to how ridiculous those teams are and then after that it's a sea of one two three four five six seven eight nine ten nl teams between 78 and 85 wins that just seems like as wide open as I can remember uh, a field. And now we're talking three wild cards. I'm not making pr pr uh, predictions this year because I'll get roasted. I'm going to do, I'm going to screw something up. Yeah. I mean, that's, I, I was looking at it and like, I mean, how many team Washington is at, at 57.9, uh, the rocks at 58. Right. Yeah. <clears throat> and then what's next? Freaking uh, pirates. Pittsburgh at 73. Yeah. Right. And like, and you, I, I don't know, like once you're at that point, like, is it really that far a jump? Like to outperform that, you know, and kind of like be in shouting distance. No, it's not. So it, it's, um, yeah, the national league aside from those, those quote unquote super teams, um, God, not much separating them when you really think about it. And you know, what does that say? I'm not sure. Um, <laughs> like, uh, I think, you know, it, it's. I, I I'm interested in this, right? Like, I mean, we are we're talking about super teams not too long ago. I mean, a couple other people, and and you know how much like that just isn't a guarantee of anything, right? Like, right. I mean, and we're seeing these projections, and clearly, these are two clubs loaded with great players. But I'm, I'm always like, I think it, I'm doubly impressed when a team that is projected to do this actually does it. Right. Um, like you know, there's this feeling from some people, oh, like, you expected that. And it's like in this sport, if you actually did what you were quote unquote expected to do, I feel like that is a much bigger deal than most would, you know, than than, you, than, than the credit they get for that. Like I, you know, I, I think it's just extraordinarily difficult to actually play up to what you're supposed to do in this sport, given how long the season is, how much luck is involved, all the stuff we've talked about before. I mean, if you think about it, the Dodgers, when, I don't remember what Pakota's projection was for them last uh, offseason, but I would assume it's 100 wins, 100 wins, 101 wins, 99 wins, something like that. Uh, the Dodgers won 100 games. And they did that with uh, 21 sort of iffy starts from Marias, uh, Tony Gonsolin, 20 starts of a five year A before he's hurt. Syndergaard only lasted 12 starts. You go down the line and it's 
players that the the Dodgers were counting on in that rotation uh, did not pan out, and they still just kind of cruised to that projection. And that that speaks to how loaded that team was, how deep that team was, and how they were able to get guys coming in, whether it's uh, uh, Bobby Miller or or you've got uh, Emma Sheehan, you know, to fill in and, and do some things here and there, but. Not every team's going to do that, but it feels like the Dodgers and Braves are just going to make stuff up. Like that's how, that's what they're good at. Just yeah, make, well, make crap up. Well, look, man. Like we've talked about those clubs a lot. I mean, this is what well-run organizations look like. Yeah. Right? Like that's what they look like. That you know, we joke about the Braves extending all their guys, but like you know, to, to be able to do that, there has to be. I think you know, you're you're they have obviously given off this aura of being really competent and buttoned up in a place where you want to be. Mm-hmm. All right. Like, yeah, money talks and like taking risk away for the players. Like, I mean, I get that that's very attractive, but I also think that part of that is like, do I want to commit to these people? Do I believe that they're going to treat me well? Like, you know, put us in a position to win all that stuff. Well, the Atlanta Braves keep proving that to be the case. Right. This is what a well-run organization looks like. And so clearly, um, given how consistent the Dodgers have been about making it to the postseason, um, you know, how deep they've gone, they've won one. Right. Like, and I know, like, you put an asterisk on that if you want, but they still won one. Um, you know, they've certainly racked up penance. Uh, those things don't happen by accident. So I, I do. I think it is, uh, you know, interesting that. You know the numbers are showing basically what is like two well-run organizations, right? Like that's that's what I see here. It, it's a, it's basically just like more confirmation of kind of what we've seen over the years, as you say, in particular with the Dodgers when dude, they were dealing with pitching issues. It felt like from the jump. I am gonna just go off script here. Pick pick Braves or Dodgers. Which one? Like you you're gonna you're gonna put a, a sawbuck down on them at the beginning of the year to to be the better team. Which one do you like a little better? Yeah, I wouldn't do that. <laughs> it's against policy. Like, oh, that's no... a good point. Okay, um, yeah. funny money. If you had to put funny money down, some monopoly money down. Yeah, if I could put some blue money down or whatever. If um... like it was like some bet where you had to eat hot chicken or something. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't know. Like, I'd probably take the Dodgers. I think you know? I'm gonna take the Braves. I don't know if that's just bias coming through. I I look at the bottom of the orders of the, their respective uh, uh, teams. And I just I, I like a little bit more what the Braves they seem like they're a little bit tougher to turn over. But again, we're talking hundred win team. So what what yeah. are we even doing here? Mm-hmm. Andy, Dodgers or Braves? Pick one. You hey guys, one. You I've been pick. listening to this dialogue for the past fifteen minutes and not uh, ferociously trying to chase a story. Uh, <laughs> so I'm pretty locked in. Uh, Dodgers or Braves? I think I'm gonna go Braves. Okay. Whoa. Uh, you were the tiebreaker. Uh, we had Marco Dodgers. I, I, got, Dodgers. I go Braves. Um, yeah, I just you, all right. Explain yourself. Well, I just I that lineup is really good. Um, I think their top three. Um, I mean, who would their top three be? It'd be uh, Acuna, uh, Olson. And uh, I don't know. I mean, Albies. yeah, Riley, you know, so like, is that Freeman Otani bets? No, but it's, you know, like you can go to, you know, you feel pretty comfortable with those three guys. I think their depth, I think their youth uh, still benefits them. They're still pretty young. Um, I, you know, I like their top end pitching. I, I don't know. I, I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong. Um, Was this a stupid question? No, what's no, I think it's interesting. I, th- yeah. I think it's interesting. I mean, I think that they're both, <clears throat> I think it's pretty clear that they're the two best teams in the sport right now. Um, it'll be interesting to see what the Astros, uh, you know, do. Um, obviously, Pakota, you know, loves them again, and um, you know, they they still have sort of the, the championship pedigree and all that stuff. Um, yeah, I, you know, I'm, I'm curious to see, like, with the Dodgers pitching, there's still a decent amount of uncertainty. Um, you know, like Yamamoto is probably going to be pretty good. You know, I, I, I think that's a fair bet, but he's, you know, never pitched in, um, the United States before. And so there will be adjustment there. You know, Tyler Glass now has obviously dealt with a lot of injuries in his career. You know, Bobby Miller's never shouldered a, a you know, a full load. Walker Bueller's coming back from surgery. Um, they've, you know, just re-signed Clayton Kershaw, um, but he's not going to be back till, you know, the middle of the summer, most likely. And so, um, you know, just still, but, you know, they signed James Paxton, which is like, whoa, James Paxton, you know, he's pretty good. And then, but, you know, he's also 
fairly, you know, injury prone. And so, um, you know, there's a lot to like, obviously, about where the Dodgers are at, but there's still some of it you can, you know, you have to really, obviously, you have to pick some nits because uh, they're just going to, they're going to just beat the living hell out of a lot of teams. Um, but we're asking who's the best team. And I think the Braves maybe have, uh, I, I don't know. I think they're a little bit better, but I could very easily be wrong. Yeah. All right. Let's. So there are eight teams in the NL that are between 80 and 85 wins, right? You've got the Phillies, the Mets, the Marlins, the Cardinals, the Cubs, uh, the Diamondbacks, the Giants. Uh, which of these teams should look at these projected standings? And I'm sure, it, to be very clear, they have their own internal models of, of this stuff. Like this is not, they're not logging on to baseball prospectus and going, oh, jeepers, you know. They they have some sense of where they think that they're at. Which team, though, should look at a muddled sort of wild card class in the National League and say, gosh, we can get this player and maybe someone else and really separate ourselves from the pack to a, a degree that's worth it? Hmm. The Giants. I was going to say, you want to say the Giants. <laughs> like, you I didn't. Up and be like, the Giants. Every episode, you're like, hey, is there a team out there? That's not where that I could would really However, benefit <clears throat> from Aaron am, Judge. Uh, no, but seriously, it's like if you if you're the honestly, I'm thinking Cubs. You know, I'm looking at the Cubs and I'm going, okay, they, they kind of got to get Bellinger back at this point. Like that's mm. that just makes so much sense. They're yeah. right there. That central is so up for grabs to to the point where I think the Brewers are still in it. You know, despite trading Corbin Burns, I don't think yeah. that they're <laughs> punting on the season necessarily. No, they're not. Yeah, so it's like it seems like the teams in the central is where I was going, smart Alec. <laughs> Dude, um, I had the same thought though, Andy. Like, I just didn't want to be a jerk, and yeah. so like, you know, I'm glad you went in because like, man, I'm like, this is a damn giant setup. And it's it, all it's yeah. every week, every, every week we week. do this. Since this is like bags and brisby for Christ's sake. Yeah, I think that the the Cubs are the one who make the most sense outside of the Giants, and that the Cubs have demonstrated a willingness to, you know, sort of ex like give out those type of contracts in a way that like, yeah, would the Brewers be better if they signed Blake Snell? Yes. They're not going to sign Blake Snell, you know? Um, so I, I think that, you know, the Cubs make a lot of sense uh, in terms of, you know, reeling in one of these big four, um, you know, free agents remaining the, you know, the four uh, gentlemen repped by uh, the Boris Corp. So, yeah, I mean, I, I would suspect that one of them will land in Chicago and maybe one of them will land in San Francisco. But, you know, who knows? It's it's February 6th. Like we've been we've been saying the same crap for, you know, the entire winter and it hasn't changed yet. All right, let me ask you this with the Cardinals now projected to be uh, at the top of the NL Central uh, by a you know, four game margin, which isn't insubstantial or unsubstantial for projections. Are we mad at them? Even more mad for going the Kyle Gibson, Lance Lynn route? Uh, you know, Sonny Gray was a great signing. We said that at the time. We think that now. Um, or are are they oddly prescient? Are they oddly like, are they are they redeemed now? Because they're looking to be like a sturdy, hey, we're going to uh, give our go in the central. Doesn't thing. it feel like the latter? To I mean, to me, it like my first impression is like, hey, man, like you, you have done enough to distance yourselves from the competitors in your direct division. Set a floor. Um, like, I mean, I don't know. Like, doesn't that seem like kind of the assignment? Like, if you're approaching it the way they are, like, didn't, I mean, like, why not? Like, you're doing what you need to do. Like, like you said, it's not like 85 and a half versus 80.2. It's not a, like you said, dude, not a small gap when it comes to these things. So, uh I think the counter would be if you're uh, – I hesitate to use the phrase long-suffering Cardinals fan. Um, <laughs> I think the counter would be, though, you're the Cardinals. Why are you aiming for 86 wins? Yeah. You know? That, that's fair. I mean, and, and they've got uh, a, not like the – a real fast closing window, but you've got Goldschmidt's 36 and Arenado's 33 or so. Um, you know, you've got Wilson Contreras on a, a bigger deal and he's not exactly getting younger. So it's not, they're still not the oldest team, but there is a little bit of consideration for, we've got these guys now and is Kyle Gibson really the person to, to push them over the top? Yeah, I think that, I mean, like, look, the window is, is the primes of Goldschmidt and Arenado and, you know, 
Goldschmidt is kind of on the other side of the mountain, um, you know, and Arnauto is trending that way, and they could still be, you know, excellent players. And Goldschmidt was the MVP two years ago, but um, yeah, and so you would want to sort of capitalize on that, especially when you still have this like core of younger players um, who you can kind of all as you know you can squint at all of them and be like I don't know that guy could be like a four or five win player you know and that's not even getting into the guys who are like sort of the top prospects of the you know the Jordan Walkers and the Mason wins I'm thinking more about you know like Brendan Donovan you know Lars Newbar, Nolan Gorman types where you're kind of like I think a lot of teams will probably be interested in players of that ilk um, you know on the sort of the 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 controllable contracts they're on right now. So yeah. Um, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> this, is, this hasn't been our best pod. I'm sorry, guys. I'm, That's all right. No, I, I thought you were going places when you were going, I'm never going anywhere. <laughs> How about yeah. this American league? Huh? Fellas? Like, <laughs> why do they like the Yankees so much? They always, why like is the- Dakota always so cozy with the New York Yankees? I think it, when a, a editor in chief, Craig Goldstein, uh, actually he moved. I think maybe got fired. No, he's still there. Um, they said <laughs> they had like the two best hitters in the American League projected, uh, and that counts for an awful lot. And hmm. uh, you know, it's hard to hard to argue against that. I guess you know you've got Juan Soto, Aaron Judge. Uh, that makes up for lots and lots and lots because those are two of the literal best hitters in the world. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think that the, you know you also if you punch i mean they were like i think they were projected to win like 99 games last year weren't they or they're projected to win the division last year as i recall fan graphs love them I mean, fan graphs did love them um i remember that you know we talked about this on the pod where like i picked them over the blue jays because we all you know we thought the blue jays were kind of the the ascendant team and i was like i don't know like the you know you look at the the projections the, the the metrics love the Yankees like and they just won 99 games like I think they'll do it again and then you know that is what happened right I forget <laughs> um so clearly like they have things and we've talked about this over and over that like their pitching program like does things that hit the right sort of bells to project out to future success um and that is often translated to future success on the you know actual success on the field in terms of the pitching the difference is that the you know the offense just got so uh injury you know ravaged last year and um yeah i mean like i think if you have aaron judge and juan soto that's a pretty great place to start when you are building a team i think what their uh their fans would you know uh, push back at is you're still reliant on, you know, DJ LeMahieu and Giancarlo Stanton in a way that, you know, they're probably not thrilled about, you know, Anthony Rizzo is coming back from a major head injury, which, you know, you just don't know, um, you know, what, what's going on there. And so, um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I think that I, I would, it wouldn't shock me if they won the division again. Um, no. I don't, they're not going to be a trendy pick though, because, you know, the Orioles are coming off. So all those, you know, such a great season last year. Um, and, you know, they just got Corbin Burns. And so, you know, as we all know, it'll probably be the Rays. Uh, we don't know why. We don't know how, <laughs> but it will probably be the Tampa Bay Rays winning 97 <laughs> games. I I will say that if you're looking at why Picoto likes the Yankees, a big part of it has to do with uh, they think Carlos Rodon and Nestor Cortez are going to contribute and contribute a fair amount. And that might be your litmus test to like, yeah, I'm buying that. You know, they're not projecting Rodon for uh, 200 innings, but they are projecting for 125, which is not that's closer to 200 innings than he usually gets uh and then cortez he had a down year he was hurt um but they're projecting him to give 137 pretty quality innings so possible possible likely i don't know but if you are just saying yeah you know what some positive contributions from those two will go a long way then i think you're buying what the projections are selling as regards to the yankees and if you're saying now one of those guys is going to be hurt and it's probably rodon and that's not going to work uh, then you're not buying mm. on the yankees <laughs> right, right, and that's right, why right. i'm not buying on that projection i mean i've said yeah. it like i think the rodon deal was just whatever process that led to it needs to be blown up all right, like that was just a bad move from the jump. They have paid the price for it. They're going to continue to pay the price for it. Nestor Cortez is somebody who, you know, this guy's pitching with such guts, right? Like, and if, if you're living that way and then he's been hurt, like it's hard to, you know, bank on that guy. It's a great story. And I don't want to take away from the success that he's had. Yeah. Like, I mean, he's, he's worked for that. And like, he's a skilled major league pitcher. 
also that's a tough way to live in this era right like yeah, the, the kind of game that he has to pitch and whatever there's a reason why it doesn't succeed often it's extremely hard to do all right now he's done it and i think he should you know there's some level of benefit of the doubt you build into that but i think part of the, the you know the trade-off of, of you know being that kind of pitcher in this era is that you know that if it goes sideways like it's hard to stem that sometimes it's not like you don't have like the swing and miss to lean mm -hmm. on you don't have the big power stuff to lean on um that's why it was incredible when he was in the middle of doing this and having success like you have to remember like that's really impressive and it's clearly somebody that's pitching with a lot of guts um hard to bet on it though so yeah. you know like that that's my thing and I, again especially with nestor cortez i don't want to knock the guy i'm just saying right you don't bet on dudes like that that's that's yeah. why so i have a thought kind of related to rodon um that's kind of in this vein and I, we talk i i feel like i've talked about this often on the on the pod before one of the things i really like about the Rangers going after uh, uh, Marcus Simeon is that he is a player who in his career had been bad and made himself good mm. and then had kind of regressed and then re like he had demonstrated the ability to make adjustments and remain sort of a, a, a good player, good to great player. And like that, that led me to believe the person with his sort of skill set and, um, you know, intellect and athleticism and all those things he could handle getting older, you mm. know, uh, and you saw it even like two years ago, last year, like he was like the worst player in baseball, you know, for like a month or two. And then he finished the year and he had like, oh, wow, he had a four win season. Anyway, so I was thinking about that with regards to Rodon, right? Because mm. like Rodon is a player who, who was he last year? He was a guy who was hurt and who was not very good. Who was Carlos Rodon in like 2019, 2020? He was a guy who was hurt and not very good. And he found a way to, you know, in 2021 and 22, you know, be one of the, you know, better pitchers in the sport. And so I was thinking like, okay, apply that met, you know, your, your, what you like about Simeon, does that make sense? And I guess what I wonder is like, is it just different with pitchers where like that, you know, where it's just like, if it, when you get to 30 and the arm and body stops working, is it just like, you just can't you know what i'm saying like yeah. I, I feel like you don't want to just as soon as the guy starts to get hurt again and be like oh it's over you know because he's demonstrated he's been hurt and bad and all of a sudden he's like healthy and good so you don't want to just immediately rule it out but it does feel different for pitchers right well i think it's also the age right andy like you, you know the repeating that cycle gets so yeah. much harder as you yeah. get older all right and so yes yeah, like you've been through it and maybe there's some things that you learn about your body. And I believe that when you hear players say that, that they figure themselves out a little bit. Yeah. But that said, I just think the challenge gets so much difficult. Yeah. So yeah, yeah he, like it's just because they're pitchers too. But like we're just talking about, man, it's hard to replicate right. that. And he's he's entering his age 31 season. So there you go. Um and uh, and like, but you know, you say age 31, and it's like on one hand, you're like, woof, well. No, it's pretty old, but also it's like it's age 31. You know, it's not it's not ancient. It's it's still I don't know. It's within the realm of possibility that he's pretty good this year, I think. Yeah, I, I think the, the biggest thing with what you're saying with pitchers is that the what <laughs> a lot of people don't realize is the margin of error for these pitchers to the difference between Carlos Rodon's best slider and Carlos Rodon's slightly below average slider. Like it's not that it's a very fine line when it comes to pitching and mechanics and, and health and how you're feeling. It's not as if you need to be just like, Oh, it's not like you've got a health meter in a video game and you need to be way over here to not have that, that good slider. It's like your health meter goes down beep, and then all of a yeah. sudden, like everything's exponential. So yeah. I think with pitchers, it's a little more like that. Uh, when you were talking about, I forgot we were talking about Rodon and when you're talking about a player who's, been bad and making himself better and coming back from the abyss like Simeon all of a sudden I was thinking like yeah Cody Bellinger you know yeah. like yeah you know that is that shows some gumption but Bellinger scares me <clears throat> because now he's such a different like his strikeout yeah. rate went down by 50 like percent or something just bananas who does that that shows a right. that he's a freak but b he's the kind of freak who might reinvent himself next year and it's like, you know, now I'm this kind of hitter. It's like a musician right. going like, oh, I'm not doing punk rock. I'm doing Zydeco, like, you know, sort of that thing. That was always a, a a concern. I think it's fair to say among Dodgers officials is that you weren't totally sure what type of player you were going to get. 
you know, with Bellinger from year to year, I remember, you know, in 2020, like he was like making swing changes and spring training and, and Dodgers people were like, he won the MVP last year, you know, but that's just, that just was kind of his nature. And so, and I think like when you look at, you know, the adjust, he clearly like made adjustments last year to cut down on the whiffs and to like try and be better in two strike counts and demonstrated that he can make it work. And you can look at that, you know, in, in a couple of ways, you can look at that and go, wow, this player is like super, uh, you know, versatile and able to make all these adjustments, blah, 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 you know, or you could look at it as like, this guy is this age and still hasn't totally figured out who he wants to be as a hitter. And the general consensus of like, when you look at batted ball data like this is you don't want to bet on it long-term. Um, and so, you know, that's the, that's the challenge I think in trying to like, is this guy a freak athlete who can kind of do anything he wants on the baseball field? Or is he a guy who, you know, like has dealt with a ton of injuries in the last few years and may have just had some really good batted ball luck in 2023. I have no answers to that. I I, I don't have a list. No, no, no. I mean, what I mean by that, I was going somewhere. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Is that I don't have a list of like the most interesting free agents of the past 10, 20 years, but just off the top of my head, Bellinger is top five, top three. As, as far as guys, yeah. I don't know how excited I would be if, if uh, the team I followed got him. I don't know how scared I would be. It's just fascinating. He's just a fascinating profile. You're never going to get that again. And then you add Boris into the mix and it's like, oh, well, teams will have some good clay to work with. Um, <laughs> you know, it makes it extra fascinating. <laughs> Did the career arc find, you know, like that's a top five career arc like, as far as like um, the interest up and downs, whatever you want to call it. Like, and so, yeah, I would agree with you, man. Like as far as, um, you know, upper end free agents that have had that kind of history. Um, I don't know, like what comes to mind. I don't, I don't even know how, like who would compare yeah. there. So um, yeah, like it's uh, um, certainly like a, that's a, a decision I don't envy for sure like having to make sense of like those ups and downs. All right. We're at the end. Uh, Super Bowl predictions. <laughs> uh, come on. I mean, the chiefs are going to win. Like, you know, this, and th this is not like we have, it's we rigged have, for Taylor Swift. That is funny, right? Oh, it, it, they, <laughs> they really are losing their minds, you know, like, and I, it was just I, like this in baseball when Matt Kemp was dating Rihanna. Yeah. Have we talked about this? I think actually the Cespedes barbecue kids took my idea when I was like, who'd be the funniest uh, baseball player to date Taylor Swift? And like the obvious answer is Pete Alonzo. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I don't know. I Yeah, the Chiefs are going to win. I think Jose Altuve would be pretty funny. Maybe we uh, can talk about this on the pod. Didn't Mark say like uh, Mark said someone funny like Heath Bell or something like that? <laughs> yeah. Oh man, I think we did, and I have no remember. Yeah. I don't have any recollection. Oh, it was yeah, producer Brian. It was Brian Vogelbach. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. There it is, Vogel and Vogelbach. Yeah. Oh, look what did that. I say his name was? Brian, because you're saying producer Brian. Brian produce. Yes. No, it's our producer Brian Vogelbach. This has been episode 81. Uh, we'll be back in two weeks, and we'll talk about uh, baseball. Taylor Swift dating Jose Altuve, stuff like that. So we'll see you then. <laughs> <laughs>